Anguttara Nikaya, The Numerical Discourses, Dasaka Nipata, Book of the Tens, Suttas 41 to 50, Akko Savadvagga, The Section on Abuse, Vivada Sutta, On Arguments, once the Venerable Upali came and approached the Blessed One, and after paying homage to the teacher, sat to one side and said, Bhante, why do arguments, quarrels, disputes and contention arise within the Sangha, whereby the peace and quiet the bhikkhus have come searching for are simply lost? Here, Upali, when the bhikkhus introduce or explain what is adhamma as dhamma, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what is dhamma, but introduce or explain it as adhamma, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the sangha. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what is not the vinaya, as Vinaya, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what is Vinaya, but introduce or explain it as being not part of the Vinaya, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what has not been taught or spoken by the Tathagata, Presenting it, however, as having been taught and spoken by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what has indeed been taught and spoken by the Tathagata, as not having been taught or spoken by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what has not been practiced by the Tathagata, presenting it, however, as having been practiced by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what has indeed been practiced by the Tathagata as not having been practiced by the Tathagata, then Arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what has not been approved by the Tathagata, while presenting it as having been approved by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what has indeed been approved by the Tathagata, but as not having been approved by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. Therefore, Upali, these are the ten reasons why arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha, whereby the very peace and quiet the bhikkhus have come searching for are simply lost. Patama Vivada Mula Sutta Roots of Arguments, Part 1 on another occasion, the Venerable Upali came and approached the Blessed One, and after paying homage to the teacher, sat to one side and said, Bhante, how many are the roots that one may find for arguments to arise within the Sangha, whereby the peace and quiet the bhikkhus have come searching for are simply lost? Hear Upali. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what is adhamma as dhamma, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what is Dhamma but introduce or explain it as Adhamma, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what is not the Vinaya as Vinaya, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what is the Vinaya, but introduce or explain it as being not part of the Vinaya, then arguments, quarrels, disputes, and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what has not been taught or spoken by the Tathagata, but while presenting it as having been taught and spoken by the Tathagata, 
and then arguments, quarrels, disputes and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what has indeed been taught and spoken by the Tathagata, as not having been taught nor spoken by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what has not been practiced by the Tathagata, presenting it as having been practiced by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what has indeed been practiced by the Tathagata as not having been practiced by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus introduce or explain what has not been approved by the Tathagata, but while presenting it as having been approved by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes and contention arise within the Sangha. When bhikkhus discuss what has indeed been approved by the Tathagata as not having been approved by the Tathagata, then arguments, quarrels, disputes and contention arise within the Sangha. Therefore, Upali, these are the ten roots that one may find for arguments to arise within the Sangha, whereby the peace and quiet the bhikkhus have come searching for are simply lost. Dutiya Vivada Mula Sutta Roots of Arguments, Part 2 Bhante, how many are the roots for arguments? Upali, there are ten roots for arguments. What ten? Here, Upali, when bhikkhus explain what is not an offense or wrong action, as being an offense, a wrong action. When bhikkhus explain what is in fact a light or minor offense as an actual offense. When bhikkhus explain what is an actual offense as a lesser or minor offense. When bhikkhus explain a serious or terrible offense as a not so terrible or serious offense. When bhikkhus explain an offense that has been carefully planned out with evil intention as not being a carefully planned out offense with evil intention. When bhikkhus explain an offense that has not been planned with evil intention, but as being a carefully planned out offense with evil intention. When bhikkhus explain an offense that can be easily remedied, as an offense that cannot be easily remedied. When bhikkhus explain an offense that cannot be remedied at all, as an offense that could be easily remedied. When bhikkhus explain an offense that can be rectified as one that cannot be rectified. When bhikkhus explain an offense that cannot be rectified as one that can be rectified. These, therefore, upali, are the ten roots for arguments. Kusinara Sutta in Kusinara. At one time, the Blessed One was living in the Baliharana forest in the region of Kusinara. It was there that the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus and said, Bhikkhus, a bhikkhu who intends on accusing or reproving another bhikkhu, should first examine and reflect upon five things within himself to see whether he himself possesses them. Also, he must be established in five things and only afterwards proceed to accuse or reprove another. Now what are these five things he must first examine to see if he does possess himself? Here, the bhikkhu who intends on accusing or reproving another bhikkhu should first reflect and examine to see whether his own bodily behavior is indeed pure by asking himself. Am I truly pure in my bodily behavior? Are my physical actions or my bodily behavior really to be considered blameless, pure, flawless, and therefore irreprovable? Do I possess this very behavior for which I am about to accuse or reprove another bhikkhu, or do I not? Now, bhikkhus, if it so happens that the accusing bhikkhu's behavior itself is not pure, 
where his bodily actions are to be considered blameworthy, impure, flawed, and therefore reprovable, then it should not come as a surprise when other bhikkhus call him out and accuse him also as they exclaim, Friend, please look at your own behavior and train yourself first. After all, you also engage in such behavior and bodily actions that are blamable and flawed. Therefore, he must first make sure that his bodily behavior and actions themselves are pure and impeccable before accusing or reproving another, or else others will blame him and chastise him instead. Next, the bhikkhu who intends on accusing or reproving another bhikkhu should first reflect and examine to see whether his own speech or verbal behavior is indeed pure by asking himself, Am I truly pure in my speech or verbal behavior? Is my speech or verbal actions or behavior really to be considered blameless, pure, flawless, and therefore irreprovable? Do I possess this very behavior for which I am about to accuse or reprove another bhikkhu, or do I not? Now, bhikkhus, if it so happens that the accusing bhikkhu's speech or verbal behavior itself is not pure, where his speech or verbal actions are to be considered blameworthy, impure, flawed, and therefore reprovable, then it should not come as a surprise when other bhikkhus call him out and accuse him also, as they exclaim, Friend, please look at your own speech and verbal behavior and train yourself first. After all, you also engage in such speech or verbal actions that are blamable and flawed. Therefore, he must first make sure that his speech and verbal actions themselves are pure and impeccable before accusing or reproving another, or else others will blame him and chastise him instead. Next, the bhikkhu who intends on accusing or reproving another bhikkhu should first reflect and examine to see whether his own mind is indeed pure and infused with metta, instead of resentment or contention towards his companions in the holy life, by asking himself, Am I truly pure with a heart that is infused with metta towards my fellow companions in the holy life? Is my heart really to be considered blameless, pure, flawless, and therefore irreprovable in its intentions? Do I possess this very quality of universal loving-kindness towards others for which I am about to accuse or reprove another bhikkhu, or am I really resentful towards others? Now, bhikkhus, if it so happens that the accusing bhikkhu's heart itself is not pure, empty and lacking of any metta towards his fellow companions in the holy life, behaving with resentment and contention towards others, then it should not come as a surprise when other bhikkhus call him out and accuse him also, as they exclaim, Friend, please look at your own heart and train yourself to have more metta in yourself first. After all, you also behave with resentment towards your fellow companions in the holy life. Therefore, he must first make sure that his heart is infused with metta, being pure and impeccable, and empty of any resentment towards his companions in the holy life, before accusing or reproving another, or else others will blame him and chastise him instead. Next, the bhikkhu who intends on accusing or reproving another bhikkhu should reflect and do a self-examination first by asking himself, Am I truly learned, and do I apply the treasures I have learned from the Dhamma myself? Have I truly studied and keep in my heart the Dhamma that is beautiful in its beginning, beautiful in its middle, and beautiful in its end? Do I really know their full meaning and phrasing in both their words and letters that delineate the perfectly complete and pure holy life? Do I remember the Dhamma I have learned by practicing it through verbally reciting and mentally pondering and investigating the treasures it contains? 
And have I understood and penetrated into their true meaning, or have I not? Now bhikkhus, if it so happens that the accusing bhikkhu is not learned, nor studied the Dhamma, not keeping it in his heart, the Dhamma that is beautiful in its beginning, beautiful in its middle, and beautiful in its end, and if he does not really know their full meaning and phrasing in both, their words and letters that delineate the perfectly complete and pure holy life, and if he does not remember the Dhamma he has learned, nor practices it through verbally reciting and mentally pondering and investigating the treasures it contains, and thus not having understood and penetrated into their true meaning, then it should not come as a surprise when other bhikkhus call him out and accuse him also, as they exclaim, Friend, Please look at your own level of understanding of the Dhamma and train yourself in it first before you speak or accuse another. Therefore, he must first make sure that he does have the learning and understanding of the Dhamma or else others will blame him and chastise him instead. Next, the bhikkhu who intends on accusing or reproving another bhikkhu should reflect and do a self-examination first by asking himself, Am I properly trained and taught in both patimokkhas? Thus, do I really know them in detail, by having scrutinized and carefully determined their various aspects of application? Therefore, do I know myself how each of their respective rules should be explained, the decisions to be made accordingly and followed, or do I not? Now, bhikkhus, if it so happens that the accusing bhikkhu is not properly trained or taught in both the patimokkhas, thus does not really know them in detail, by having scrutinized and carefully determined their various aspects of application, nor himself knows how each of their respective rules should be explained, the decisions to be made accordingly and followed, then he might very well be asked the following. Well then, friend, where and when exactly has the Blessed One stated that? Therefore, by not having the proper response to such a legitimate question, it should not come as a surprise when other bhikkhus call him out and accuse him also, as they exclaim, Friend, please look at your own level of understanding of the Patimokkha and train yourself in it first before you speak or accuse another. Therefore, he must first make sure that he does have the learning, the training, and understanding of the Patimokkha or else others will blame him and chastise him instead. So, bhikkhus, these are the five things the bhikkhu must first examine to see if he does possess himself, those qualities for which he will accuse someone else. And what, bhikkhus, are the five qualities necessary to first be established within oneself before accusing, reproving, or correcting another? Here, the bhikkhu, wishing to accuse or reprove another, must first establish himself in these five qualities. I will speak only at the appropriate time, and not when it is inappropriate. I will utter words that are true, speaking truthfully, not falsely. I will be kind and empathic in my speech, not being carelessly harsh in my speech. I will speak with the intention to benefit, neither malicious nor trying to harm the listener. I will speak with loving kindness, not with hatred. These are the five qualities necessary to first be established within oneself before accusing, reproving, or correcting another. Bhikkhus, a bhikkhu who intends on accusing or reproving another bhikkhu, should first examine and reflect upon these five things within himself to see whether he himself possesses them. Also, he must be established in these five qualities before accusing, reproving, or correcting another. Rajante Purap
Pave Sana Sutta. Entering the king's inner courtyard. Bhikkhus, these are the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which put lives in danger. What are these ten? Here, Bhikkhus, while the king is sitting with or spending time with the queen, the bhikkhu enters the inner courtyard of the palace. Now on seeing the bhikkhu entering, either the queen smiles to the bhikkhu or the bhikkhu smiles back on seeing the queen. As a result, the king begins reflecting. Truly, these two must have a liking for each other and perhaps even something more. Some evil and immoral action surely must be going on between them, or, at the very least, they will certainly be engaging in some sexual misconduct in the future. This because is the first of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. Again, because while the king is busily tending to his duties at court, he finds out that one of the women in his harem is now pregnant. Then the king considers how, due to his engagement with his royal duties, he must not have had the time to spend with that particular woman, nor recalls the last time he had been with her. So he begins reflecting. Aside from myself, no one other than that bhikkhu has entered the inner courtyard, so he must have impregnated that woman in my harem. This bhikkhu is the second of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. Next bhikkhu the king discovers that one of his precious gems is missing or lost. Then he begins reflecting. Aside from myself, no one other than that bhikkhu has entered the inner courtyard, so he must have taken my precious gem. This bhikkhu is the third of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. Next, because the king discovers how some of his secret conversations held within the royal inner courtyard have now been exposed and spread outside the palace walls. Then he begins reflecting. Aside from myself, no one other than that bhikkhu has entered the inner courtyard of the palace while I was engaged in those secret conversations. So he must have talked to others and exposed us. This because is the fourth of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. Next, because the king hears about a commotion within the royal harem involving a father looking for his son, or a son in search of his father. Then the king begins reflecting. Aside from myself, no one other than that bhikkhu has entered the inner courtyard of the palace, so he must have been behind this whole affair. This bhikkhu is the fifth of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. And when bhikkhus, the king raises the status of someone, by promoting his role at court, those who become resentful on hearing this quickly become upset and start making the assertion. It is all because of that bhikkhu and the close ties he has with the king and his influence on the king in the royal court. This bhikkhu is the sixth of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. And when, because the king reduces the status of someone by demoting his role at court, those who become resentful on hearing this 
quickly become upset and start making the assertion. It is all because of that bhikkhu and the close ties he has with the king and his influence on the king in the royal court. This bhikkhus is the seventh of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. And when bhikkhus, the king sends out his army on a mission, but without the knowledge or approval of his close advisers, who in turn become resentful on learning about it, quickly become upset and start making the assertion, it is all because of that bhikkhu and the close ties he has with the king and his influence on the king in the royal court. This bhikkhus is the eighth of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. And when the king orders his army to leave their mission and immediately return back to the city gates, but without the knowledge or approval of his close advisers, who in turn become resentful on learning about it and quickly become upset and start making the assertion, it is all because of that bhikkhu and the close ties he has with the king and his influence on the king in the royal court. This because is the ninth of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. And because when there is a celebration or some entertainment taking place within the inner royal courtyard, where various shows are going on for the members of the court to enjoy, including shows with elephants, horses, chariots, and various other sensory, stimulating, and provocative images and forms, sounds, aromas, flavors, and touches that are all on display, all of which are inappropriate for a bhikkhu to be present to witness or allow himself to be exposed to. This bhikkhus is the tenth of the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which puts lives in danger. Bhikkhus, these, therefore, are the ten risks involved with entering the inner courtyard of the king's palace, which put lives in danger. Sakka Sutta The Sakyans at one time, the Blessed One was staying at the Nigrodha Monastery in the royal city of Kapilavatthu, in the country of the Sakyans. It was then, during that full moon day, when many Sakyans came and approached the Blessed One, paid their homage by bowing and then sat to one side. Then the Blessed One addressed the Sakyan disciples who were now seated there by saying, Sakyans, do you observe the eight precepts on the full moon Uposata day? Bhante, on certain days we do observe the eight precepts, but on other days we do not. Then it is a great loss, a real misfortune for you all, Sakyans. Truly a rare chance for you to miss, Sakyans how although you go on living a life that is mired by grief and subject to death, where you go on observing the eight precepts of the full moon Uposata day only on certain days, but not on others. Here, imagine, Sakyans, that there was someone who, having worked for a living without engaging in anything unwholesome, earns half a kahapana coin for his daily work. Now, would you not consider that man to be hard-working and industrious, through which he earns a living? Yes, indeed, Bhante. Now, imagine, Sakyans, that there was another man, who, having worked for a living, without engaging in anything unwholesome, and earns himself a full kahapana coin for his daily work. Now, would you not consider that man to be hard-working and industrious, through which he earns a living? Yes, indeed, Bhante. And Sakyans? How about imagining others, who, having worked for a living without engaging in anything unwholesome, 
earn two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, one hundred, or even one thousand kahapana coins, respectively, for their daily work? Now, would you not consider such men to be hard-working and industrious, through which they earn a living? Oh, yes, indeed, Bande. In that case, Sakins, if those among them who earned a hundred or even a thousand kahapana coins every day continue doing so as they accumulate their earning for a period of one hundred years, while having a long lifespan of one hundred years, would they then have accumulated a massive fortune? Absolutely, Bante. Well then, Sakyans, do you say that such a man, now having amassed such wealth, and the great wealth and treasures he has accrued, would he be able to experience happiness exclusively and throughout with them, where he could enjoy pleasure and bliss absolutely and nothing else, even for one night or one day? Or how about even half a night or half a day? Oh, no, Bante, that will not be possible. And why is that, Sakyans? Because, Bante, since pleasures are, by nature, impermanent, they are passing and transitory, unreliable they are, fake and deceptive things. However, Sakyans, consider any of my own disciples who lives diligently, dedicating themselves to practicing and training ardently by following the instructions received from me. Such a mindfully heedful student will indeed experience happiness exclusively for ten years straight, or ten thousand years, or even one hundred thousand years. Not only that, Sakyans, but they would also enjoy the contentment that comes by being a once-returner, a non-returner, and most certainly and definitely a stream-winner let alone ten years, Sakyans. Any disciple of mine who lives diligently, dedicating themselves to practicing and training ardently for nine years, for eight years, for seven years, for six years, or five, four, three, or two years, or just one year, following the instructions received from me, while indeed experiencing happiness exclusively for ten years straight, or ten thousand years, or even one hundred thousand years. Not only that, Sakyans, but they would also enjoy the contentment that comes by being a once-returner, or a non-returner, and most definitely a stream-winner. Further, Sakyans, let alone one year, any disciple of mine who lives diligently, dedicating themselves to practicing and training ardently for ten months, following the instructions received from me, will indeed experience happiness exclusively for ten years straight, or ten thousand years, or even one hundred thousand years. Not only that, Sakyans, but they would also enjoy the contentment that comes by being a once-returner, or a non-returner, and most definitely a stream-winner. But, let alone ten months, Sakyans, any disciple of mine who lives diligently, dedicating themselves to practicing and training ardently for nine months, for eight months, or seven, six, five, four, three, or two months, or even half a month, following the instructions received from me, will indeed experience happiness exclusively for ten years straight, or ten thousand years, or even one hundred thousand years. Not only that, Sakyans, but they would also enjoy the contentment that comes by being a once-returner, or a non-returner, and most definitely a stream-winner. Sakyans, let alone half a month. Any disciple of mine who lives diligently, dedicating themselves to practicing and training ardently for ten nights and ten days, following the instructions received from me, will indeed experience happiness exclusively for ten years straight, 
or 10,000 years, or even 100,000 years. Not only that, Sakyans, but they would also enjoy the contentment that comes by being a once-returner, or a non-returner, and most definitely a stream winner. Never mind the ten days and nights, Sakyans. Any disciple of mine who lives diligently, dedicating themselves to practicing and training ardently for nine nights and nine days, or eight nights and days, or seven nights and days, or six nights and days, or five nights and days, or four nights and days, or three nights and days, or two nights and days, or even a single night and a single day, following the instructions received from me, will indeed experience happiness exclusively for ten years straight, or ten thousand years straight, or even one hundred thousand years. Not only that, Sakyans, but they would also enjoy the contentment that comes by being a once-returner, or a non-returner, and most definitely a stream-winner. Therefore, Sakyans, it is a great loss, a real misfortune for you all, Sakyans, truly a rare chance for you to miss. How, although you go on living a life that is mired by grief and subject to death, where you go on observing the eight precepts of the full moon Pusa today only on certain days, but not during others. Bhante, from today onwards, we shall dedicate ourselves completely as we observe the eight precepts of the full moon Uposata day. Mahali Sutta Discourse to Mahali At one time the Blessed One was staying at the gabled hall in the great forest in the princely city of Vesali. It was during that time when the Lichavi prince Mahali came and approached the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, sat to one side and spoke these words. Bhante, what is the cause or condition for beings to want to engage in evil behavior and bad merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of evil actions? Mahali Greed is the cause and condition for beings to want to engage in evil behavior and bad merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of evil actions. Hatred is the cause and condition for beings to want to engage in evil behavior and bad merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of evil actions. Delusion is the cause and condition for beings to want to engage in evil behavior and bad merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of evil actions. Unwise radical attention is the cause and condition for beings to want to engage in evil behavior and bad merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of evil actions. The wrongly directed heart is the cause and condition for beings to want to engage in evil behavior and bad merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of evil actions. And what, Bhante, is the cause or condition for beings to want to engage in good behavior and lovely merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of good actions? Mahali, non-greed is the cause and condition for beings to want to engage in good behavior and lovely merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of good actions. Non-hatred is the cause and condition for beings to want to engage in good behavior and lovely merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of good actions. Non-delusion is the cause and condition for beings to want to engage in good behavior and lovely merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of good actions. Wise radical attention is the cause and condition 
for beings to want to engage in good behavior and lovely, merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of good actions. Possessing a heart that is not wrongly directed is the very cause and condition for beings to want to engage in good behavior and lovely, merit-making actions, for the continuously manifesting outcomes of good actions. Therefore, Mahali, if these ten things were not found or perpetuated in the world, then all that goes against the Dhamma, behaviors and conducts that lack any integrity or principles, as well as not living a life of peace, will continue to exist and even proliferate. Conversely, living according to the Dhamma, behaviors and conducts that are strengthened by integrity and noble principles, as well as leading a peaceful life, would also not exist and even get a chance to proliferate either, if these ten things were not found or perpetuated in the world. However, Mahali, because these ten things are found and perpetuated in the world, then all that which goes against the Dhamma, behaviors and conducts that lack any integrity or principles, as well as not living a life of peace, continue to exist and even proliferate. Conversely, living according to the Dhamma, behaviors and conducts that are strengthened by integrity and noble principles, as well as leading a peaceful life, also exist and even proliferate too, because these ten things are to be found and perpetuated in the world. Pabbajita Abhinaha Sutta Reflections for those gone forth Bhikkhus These are the ten things that should be constantly reflected upon by all who have gone forth. What are these ten? The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect. By choosing this lifestyle, I have willingly stepped into a world that is beyond any social class or caste distinctions. The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect. By choosing this lifestyle, I have to now rely on others for my livelihood. The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect. By choosing this lifestyle, my appearance will be different from what it was in the past. The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect. By choosing this lifestyle, I now hold no one other than myself accountable for any lack in virtue, if and whenever it takes place. The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect. By having chosen this lifestyle, do my wise companions in the holy life find any reason to blame me for any faults they may have observed in my conduct or behavior that is lacking in virtue? The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect. By choosing this lifestyle, I have willingly parted ways with my past relationships, leaving behind all my kin and whomever I knew and held dear to me, relinquishing all that was enjoyed and liked by me in the past. The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect. By choosing this lifestyle, I now see that I am the ultimate owner and possessor of my actions, Kamma, the only inheritor and the source of my own Kamma. Kamma is the closest relative I have, and Kamma is my ultimate refuge, repeatedly contemplating how, whatever actions I do, good or evil, I will be their only inheritor. The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect by choosing this lifestyle. How is it that I am now really spending my days and nights as a monastic? The one who has gone forth should constantly reflect. By choosing this lifestyle, does my heart become delighted and get drawn in when seeing an empty room 
or a secluded and quiet place for practice. And the one who has gone forth should constantly reflect, by choosing this lifestyle, have I attained any sublime states, whereby I now possess the knowledge and vision that is a key attribute of all noble ones, so that when I am about to die, if and when I am to be questioned by my companions in the holy life, in the last days of my life, would I be confused about the path? Would I embarrass myself, having wasted my life? Bhikkhus, these are therefore the ten things that should be constantly reflected upon by all who have gone forth. Sarira Tadamma Sutta Results from having a body Bhikkhus, these are the ten things that result from having a body. What are these ten? Cold, heat, hunger, thirst, urinating, defecating, bodily restraint, verbal restraint, restraint in livelihood, and the generative cause determining one's next rebirth. Bhikkhus, these are therefore the ten things that result from having a body. Bandhana Sutta Disputes Once the Blessed One was living at the monastery offered by Anattapindika in Jeda's Park in the city of Savati. It was during that time when some of the bhikkhus who, having returned from their alms round and having had their meal already, were assembled in the monastery's attendance hall. Seated there, they had begun quarreling and disputing, as they mercilessly kept hurling mean words at each other, much like throwing verbal poisonous daggers at one another. Then in the evening, the Blessed One came out from his seclusion and approached the attendance hall and sat on the prepared seat. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus and said, Bhikkhus, what were you just now discussing? And what was the topic of the conversation you were having earlier? Bhante, after the meal was over and we already had returned from the daily alms round, we assembled and sat here in the attendance hall, when a quarrel began between us, bhikkhus, as we kept disputing and arguing. Thus, we mercilessly kept hurling mean words at each other, much like throwing poisonous verbal daggers at one another. Bhikkhus, this is highly inappropriate. This will not do for it is totally unacceptable behavior for bhikkhus to demonstrate. Bhikkhus, it is not suitable for clansmen like you, who, having gone forth from home life into homelessness, out of faith and your own personal choice, to engage in such demeaning behavior, where you mercilessly hurl mean words at each other, much like throwing poisonous verbal daggers at one another. Bhikkhus, there are these ten things that lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. And what are these ten? Here, Bhikkhus, the bhikkhu possesses a virtuous character, practicing and being restrained by the patimukkha. He possesses the right conduct while seeing danger in the slightest fault, as he keeps true to the rules he has undertaken, by keeping them alive in his heart, whether being alone or in public. And when the bhikkhu possesses a virtuous character, practicing and being restrained by the patimukkha, he possesses the right conduct while seeing danger in the slightest fault, as he keeps true to the rules he has undertaken by keeping them alive in his heart, 
whether being alone or in public. Then, this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Next, bhikkhus. The bhikkhu is learned, remembering and applying the treasures he has learned from the Dhamma, teachings that are beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. Knowing their full meaning and phrasing in both words and letters that delineate the perfectly complete and pure holy life. Remembering the Dhamma he has learned. And he practices it by verbally reciting and mentally pondering and investigating the treasures it contains. As he understands and penetrates into their true meaning. And when the bhikkhu is learned, remembering and applying the treasures he has learned from the Dhamma teachings that are beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end, knowing their full meaning and phrasing in words and letters that delineate the perfectly complete and pure holy life, remembering the Dhamma he has learned, he practices it by verbally reciting and mentally pondering and investigating the treasures it contains, as he understands and penetrates into their true meaning. Then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Next, the bhikkhu, being a good spiritual friend himself, associates with and surrounds himself with good spiritual friends as well. And when the bhikkhu knows how to be a good spiritual friend himself, associates with and surrounds himself with good spiritual friends as well, then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Next, bhikkhus. The bhikkhu is obedient while possessing attributes that make him easy to correct and admonish, while remaining patient and kind with humility, always willing to accept any mistakes he may have committed, as he respectfully receives and follows instructions. And when the bhikkhu is obedient, while possessing attributes that make him easy to correct and admonish, while remaining patient and kind, with humility, always willing to accept any mistakes he may have committed, as he respectfully receives and follows instructions, then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Next, bhikkhus, the bhikkhu is driven, fully engaged with dedicated effort, accomplishing many tasks and duties, whether large or small, with competence, completing chores that were to be done by his fellow companions in the holy life. And when the bhikkhu is driven, fully engaged with dedicated effort, accomplishing many tasks and duties, whether large or small, with competence, completing chores that were to be done by his fellow companions in the holy life, then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Next, bhikkhus, the bhikkhu rejoices in hearing about and discussing the Dhamma, as he talks delightedly about the higher aspects of the Dhamma and Vinaya. And when the bhikkhu rejoices in hearing about and discussing the Dhamma, as he talks delightedly about the higher aspects of the Dhamma and Vinaya, then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, 
bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Again, bhikkhus. The bhikkhu is fully dedicated to getting rid of his unwholesome qualities, while at the same time seriously driven with persevering effort to arouse and uh, accumulate more wholesome qualities in himself, sustaining his efforts diligently to stay firm, while exerting all his energies to cultivate further in his wholesome qualities. And when the bhikkhu is fully dedicated to getting rid of his unwholesome qualities, while at the same time seriously driven with persevering effort to arouse and accumulate more wholesome qualities in himself, sustaining his efforts diligently to stay firm, while exerting all his energies to cultivate further in his wholesome qualities, then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Also bhikkhus, the bhikkhu is content and satisfied with whatever kinds of robes, alms food, lodgings, and the available medical attention he receives whenever needed. And when the bhikkhu is content and satisfied with whatever kind of robes, alms food, lodgings, and the available medical attention he receives whenever needed, then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Further, bhikkhus, the bhikkhu lives with the highest degree of mindful awareness, always alert, while recalling things that were spoken and heard from a long time ago. And when the bhikkhu lives with the highest degree of mindful awareness, always alert, while recalling things that were spoken and heard from a long time ago, then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. And because the bhikkhu lives with discernment, wisely scrutinizing and observing the continuous rise and fall, the appearance and disappearance of the five grabbing aggregates, and thus comes to see with penetrating vision, which in itself leads to the absolute ending of suffering. And when the bhikkhu lives with discernment, wisely scrutinizing and observing the continuous rise and fall, the appearance and disappearance of the five grabbing aggregates, and thus comes to see with penetrating vision, which in itself leads to the absolute ending of suffering, then this will lead to warm consideration, the essence of being genuinely kind and friendly with each other, helping you to relate to others empathically, bringing about harmony and respectful cohesion among you, where disputing and quarreling simply fall off and are no more. Sad. Sad, sad, sad.